He was waiting by the cave entrance when Webbs rolled the boulder aside and came in. His wings unfurled and he leaned forward, trying to see the Guardian's claws. Just this one time, Webbs said, untangling a scroll from the net full of fish he was carrying. He tossed it to Starflight, who caught it and turned it reverently between his talons. It was damp around the edges and smelled like fish, but he didn't care. He carried it to the study cave and found Sunny curled in the small beam of sunlight that came through the hole in the roof. His heart skipped a beat as she opened her green eyes and smiled at him. A new scroll, she said. What's this one about? He sat down next to her and unrolled it carefully. It's about us. His eyes scanned the text quickly. Weird, this must have been written recently. It's all theories about where we are and who might be part of the prophecy and how it might come true. Sunny sat up and peered over his shoulder, her warm golden scales pressing against his. Wow, I'd like to know all about myself! It says there were 17 sea wing dragonets who hatched on the brightest night, but only six of them were from blue eggs, and maybe it's none of them, because perhaps there were other sea wing eggs outside the kingdom of the sea. Like children of the Talons of Peace, it says. Or an egg that was stolen by the Talons? Sunny pointed out. Right, it doesn't mention that possibility. Starflight went quiet, reading a little further. Does it say anything about the Sandwing Egg? She asked nervously. The author seems confused by that. Starflight rolled the scroll along, searching for references to Sandwings. He says if a Sandwing Dragon had hatched on its own in the desert somewhere, it couldn't have survived. So it must be someone's egg, maybe from the Talons of Peace again. That would explain hidden away from the Revo Queens. I wish the Guardians would tell us more about where our eggs came from, Sunny said with a sigh. Maybe I should skip ahead to the part about stopping the war, Starflight said, rolling the scroll through his talons. Good idea, we're taking suggestions, she joked. Any war stopping tips are welcome over here. Starflight paused on the word Skywing. It says something about how there aren't any Skywings left who were hatched on the brightest night. That's weird. They must be some in the Sky Kingdom. Maybe this author doesn't know what he's talking about. He kept reading, hoping to keep Sunny close to him for as long as possible. We don't need a Skywing anyway, she said. We've got glory. Isn't it exciting that there are dragons talking about us all over Pyrea? She added dreamily. Right now, there are soldiers camped on battlefields talking about how we're the ones who'll save them from the endless fighting. There were dragonettes who want their mothers and fathers to come home, and they know we're the ones who make it happen. We're going to make so many dragons happy, Starflight. She shifted her wings and shrugged like she was trying not to sound too dramatic. I mean, I don't know. It's just nice to know for sure that we're here for a reason, and we're going to do something important. Starflight liked the way Sunny thought about the prophecy. The idea of that many dragons relying on him always made Starflight feel overwhelmed and anxious. But for Sunny, the prophecy was a promise, not an order. Listening to her talk about it was comforting. Here, he said. Possible ways for the dragonets to fulfill the prophecy. Hmm. Alright, the first theory is that all the dragonets are royal daughters, so they'll all become queens of their tribes and stop the war that way. Sunny smothered a giggle. I could totally see Clay as a mudwing princess. He grinned back. It doesn't make sense, though, without an ice wing, and it means that you have to be the next sandwing queen. No, thank you, Sunny said firmly. I'm not Tsunami. I would never want to be queen. Starflight didn't like the idea either, although the part that bothered him was the thought of Sunny being challenged by vicious sandwings who wanted to be queen in her place. All right, let's find the next... He started, when suddenly a commotion of running claws sounded from the tunnel. They both looked up as Kestrel burst into the room with Dune and Webbs right behind her. Give me that! Kestrel snarled, snatching the scroll out of Starflight's talons. He let out a cry of dismay as it tore between their ta claws. The Skywing peered at the scroll and whipped around to glare at Webbs. What were you thinking? Handing them any piece of trash you find on the beach? The fish trader gave it to me, Webb said defensively. She knows I'm always looking for new scrolls. I didn't have time to read it, but I didn't think it sounded that bad. Where are the dragonettes of destiny? 
Kestrel read off the title. That doesn't sound dangerous to you, filling their heads with questions and ideas. Our heads are already full of questions and ideas, Sonny piped up. We'll tell you what you need to know about the prophecy, Kestrel growled at Sonny and Starflight. You don't need a pile of gossip and rumors and speculation clearing up your tiny little minds. Starflight's mind isn't at all tiny or little, Sonny objected. She glanced at Starflight, and when he didn't say anything, she whispered, Hey, your line is, neither is Sonny's. Starflight knew she was trying to make him feel better, but he was too nervous to speak. Why were the Guardians so mad? Had he done something wrong? This is not for you, Kestrel snapped, waving the scroll. She pointed at Starflight. You, battle training, now! She turned and stomped out of the cave with the other guardians close behind her. Sunny ran to the entranceway, then turned back to Starflight with a comically outraged look on her face. Are you just going to let her do that? She said. She took your scroll, that's so unfair! Starflight thought so too, but he was definitely not going to argue with Kestrel. It's alright, he said, looking down at the grey rocks below his talons. Hopefully, Webbs will bring a new scroll next week. Oh, Starflight, I know you're trying to hide it, but you're so sad now, Sunny said. She came and sat in front of him, reaching to touch his tail with her own. Listen, that scroll wasn't going to have all the answers anyway. You know that, right? Nobody knows how the prophecy will unfold. We just have to always do what we think is right, and fate will take us in the right direction. Maybe, he said. But a map on how to get there would be helpful. We don't need a map, she said, when you have excellent traveling companions, like Clay and Tsunami and Glory. And of course, me. She beamed at him. That's true, he said, feeling again how lucky he was. Of all the caves in all of Pyria, of all the eggs that could have been chosen, somehow his and hers had wound up here, and two dragons who never should have met were together. And that's how we'll always be, he thought. Starflight woke up to find a claw poking his snout. Mm -hmm, he mumbled. Everything was still and dark in the dormitory. The coal smoldered in the wall niches like the half-closed eyes of slumbering dragons. The skylight looked out onto the night with no stars. The warmth from his dream faded instantly. Sunny was far away, and he had no idea when he'd ever see her again. I can't sleep, Fate Speaker whispered in the dark. Her wings rustled as she edged closer to him, poked his shoulder again. What are you doing? Um, sleeping? Let's go explore, she said. I want to know more about our tribe, don't you? We can go look around the whole fortress while they're asleep. He rubbed his eyes and blinked at her. Won't we get in trouble? Why? she said. Nobody's told us not to. We're Nightwings, aren't we? Isn't this our fortress too? Let's explore before someone tells us we can't. There was a kind of logic to that, although Starflight wasn't sure Moro Sierra would agree with it. But really, she was right. Why should they get in trouble for acting like they belonged here? Besides, it was what Tsunami would do. And wasn't he always thinking he wanted to be more like her? He rolled off the bed onto the floor next to Fate Speaker, and they padded softly onto the tunnels. She picked a direction apparently at random, and they started to walk the empty halls. The only sound was the tapping of their own claws and the slithering of their tails on the stone. Don't be scared, Starflight told himself. Then he told himself again and a few more times. You're not doing anything wrong. There aren't any dragoners lying in wait for you. You're not being treated like a prisoner. You're a Nightwing Dragonette. This is your tribe. This is where you could have grown up. He glanced at the bare walls, not so very different from the cave where he had grown up. This is where you're supposed to be. No, I'm supposed to be where Sunny is. I'm supposed to be helping my friends stop the war. He stopped walking for a minute to take a deep breath, then hurried after Fate Speaker. All the torches had been extinguished, so the only light came from the glowing red coals on the walls. Starflight couldn't even see any of the moons when he looked out, on the out of the windows. The sky was too hidden by clouds and smoke from the volcano. He knew they wouldn't find much that might be useful, unless he was brave enough to open a door sometime, but he was terrified of waking up any sleeping night wings. He kept imagining walking straight into Morosir's room and stepping on his tail by accident, 
and the death or dismemberment, or both, that would no doubt inevitably follow. He was glad to see that Fate Speaker wasn't going in the direction of his father's lab. Mastermind was surely sleeping like the rest of the tribe, but Starflight didn't want to risk encountering him, or getting any closer to the things he had seen in there. Every once in a while, as they walked, they heard a quiet snore from the rooms as they were passing, but they saw no one awake, no guards anywhere. I guess they're used to not needing guards, Starflight whispered. Since no other tribe could find this place, they're always safe from attack. He thought for a minute. And even now that they might be attacked, they only need to post guards at the tunnel. I'm sure everyone is asleep, though, Fate Speaker whispered back. I always thought being a Nightwing meant you wanted to be awake all night. I mean, that's true for me. I can never wake up in the morning, but once it's dark, I'm full of energy. Does that happen to you? I really thought that was a Nightwing thing. But maybe my friends are right, and I'm just weird. She kicked a rock sticking out of the crack in the floor. Or maybe it is a Nightwing thing and they're all muddled here because they can't really see the night sky anymore, Starflight said. Maybe you're more of a Nightwing than any of them. She fluttered her wings, looking skeptical. As for me, I've lived in a cave with no sky most of my life, so I was on whatever schedule our guardians told us to be. But once we were free, well, it's been a strange few weeks, so it's hard to say. But I do feel more alive when the stars are out. Does that make sense? It does, she said, smiling at him. She paused at an intersection, thinking, then purposely turned right. Are we going somewhere? he asked her. Did you see the part of the fortress that collapsed? she asked. I want to see what it looks like from inside. He stopped, his heart rattling nervously. Wait, he said. It collapsed because it was covered in lava. That can't be safe to explore. She flicked her nose with her tail. Oh, stop worrying. Mighty Claus told me it happened like 11 years ago. It's just a bunch of rocks now. And he said it kind of neat looking. I guess it covered the part of the forge where they used to keep their treasure. So they had to blast tunnels into it to get their treasure out. Tunnels and lava rocks. It'll be awesome. Come on. She bounded ahead and he followed, more slowly, wishing he had listened to his original stay-in-bed instincts. Fate Speaker's sense of direction turned out to be better than her sense about dragons, and before long, they found themselves in a part of the fortress where the roof was partly gone. What looked like thick black bubbles of rock filled the hall ahead of them. Chilly air whistled through the gaps in the walls, battling with the heat of the volcano below their talons. There! Fate Speaker whispered, darting up to where the petrified lava met the wall. A tunnel just big enough for a dragon had been chiseled and blasted and dug out of the rocks. Without hesitation, she headed inside. What am I doing? Starflight asked himself. He really desperately wanted to melt into the shadows and stay there waiting for her. But he also felt as though she couldn't go in there alone. And this, th this time, there was no clay or tsunami or glory to do the brave thing for him. He was the only dragon Fate Speaker had. Taking a deep breath, he forced himself to step into the small tunnel. Jagged rock pressed in from all sides, scraping his wings on the top of his head. The tunnel twisted around quickly, so they had to dig their claws in to avoid sliding. Fate Speaker breathed a small plume of fire, but all that did was illuminate the thick, dark walls that encircled them. The air was hot and stuffy, and Starflight began to wonder if anyone had ever died exploring these tunnels. Suddenly, the tunnel turned directly down and dumped them out into the empty space. Fate Speaker fell first, letting out a shout of surprise, so Starflight had a minute's warning and was able to open his wings as soon as his claws lost their grip on the floor. Still, he tumbled several feet and landed on top of her. Oof, she said. He scrambled away and they both lit up the air with their fire at the same time. The room was small but intact. The lava had crushed the upper floors but left this one preserved. Starflight could see a small hallway outside the door with more rooms beyond that. He looked up uneasily, thinking about the weight of everything above them. Fate Speaker was already hurrying to the doorway as their fire faded into complete darkness. Mighty Claw said the old treasure room is three doors down the left! Come on! But isn't it empty? Starflight asked, following her with his front talons outstretched. Are we just going to look at an empty room? A fascinating empty room, she insisted. It used to be full of treasure! Just imagine! I've never even seen any treasure before. Oh, right, Starflight said. The Tunnels of Peace wouldn't have had any, I guess, unless some dragons brought it with them when they left their tribes. If anyone did, they kept it hidden, she said. 
She felt her tail flick against his snout accidentally as they both felt their way along the walls. You didn't have treasure in your hide under the mountain place, did ya? No, but I've been to the Sky Kingdom and the Kingdom of the Sea, Starflight said. And I saw enough treasure there to know that having lots of treasure doesn't make you a good queen or a happy tribe. I thought Queen Cora was a good queen, Fate Speaker said, sounding surprised. Well, keep in mind she wrote a lot of the scrolls you've probably read about her, Starflight said. But she's not terrible. She's better than Queen Scarlet, that's for sure. Or Blister. He shuddered, remembering the Sandwing Dragon who had been so disgusted with him. I bet the Sandwings would be happy if they could find the treasure that scavenger stole, though, Fate Speaker said. Maybe, Starflight said. There were some really famous pieces of treasure in there, including stuff that was rumored to be Animus touched. Animus touched? Fate Speaker stopped and breathed fire again. They were standing under a tall archway with two black metal doors, one of which was propped open and just enough for a dragonette to slip through. Animus touched means an object that had been magicked by an animus dragon, Starflight explained in the helpful teacher voice he sometimes used with his friends. So, the object is left with some kind of power, like a necklace that can make you invisible, or a stone that can find anyone you're looking for. Or a statue that will kill any heir to the sea wing throne it can get its claws on. It's sort of a, an archaic term because supposedly there aren't any animus dragons anymore, but that's clearly not true. There's at least one among the Sea Wings, and there must have been one not long ago among the Night Wings. Really? Fate Speaker pushed lightly on the metal door, and it groaned open another inch. He realized he didn't know how much she knew about the Night Wing Island. Yes, there's a tunnel from here to the Rainforest, and one from the Rainforest to the Kingdom of Sad, which must have been made by an Animus Dragon, he said. I guess I can't be sure how long ago it was, but none of the Rain Wings knew about them. Isn't that how you got here? She shook her head. We flew across the ocean. It was so long and so boring. I swear I nearly fell asleep and ended up in the sea a couple of times. He perked up, full of geography questions, but she was already squeezing into the room and making ooh noises. He squashed himself through the door behind her and saw, in the plume of fire she sent out, a couple of wooden sticks on the floor. He picked one up and lit it so they could walk around more easily. But when he lifted it up, the first things they both saw were the shriveled corpses of two dead dragons.